three, go. Hey everyone, hopefully you watched our economic cycles video. Um, hopefully everyone's healthy, hope everyone's doing well. Hopefully we're washing our hands. Um, I gotta let you know I'm going crazy, not having any sports to watch right now. True story. I got my Islanders jersey on right now. Sorry, Mr. Andrew Allner, I know you're a big Ranger fan. Um, so we're here today. We are going to be going over the beginnings of the Roaring Twenties, how our economy started to slump at the beginning of the decade, why that took place. We just went over that economic cycle, so it should be a little bit familiar to you. Um, so we're going to try to keep this as much like a normal lesson. You know, we have our Google Slides here. It's almost like this is our classroom now. We're in Mr. Geek's basement, <laughs> but it's going to be our classroom for now. You want this? No, you go. All yeah. right. So going back to our objective when we're talking about a slump, right? Again, we mentioned how factories during World War I were making wartime goods. Of course, if you continue to make wartime goods during peacetime, you're going to take a little bit of a hit financially because the demand for those wartime goods are not going to be high. So after the post-war, after the World War I, now we get into a post-war economy. Now, again, Mr. Kogan said in the previous lesson how we were mentioning how now you're going to have doughboys coming back from World War I and they're going to they're want jobs and they're going to get jobs deservingly. Now, after that, two million soldiers return home looking for work, right? What we're also going to see is that factories stop producing war materials and laid off workers. You start to see a little bit more of an economic slump because of that. And all these characteristics, like when we look at an economy and we talk about why economies slump, unemployment, it's going to go up. People are losing their jobs. Um, wages, those, those current workers who still have their jobs, they're like, hey, we're going to pay you a little bit less because the, the factory, the company, whoever you're working for doesn't have as much money. That supply, remember back to our last lesson, when, the supply, when there's a surplus of supplies, the demand for that supply goes down. So if you're producing radios, really big in this time, if you're producing radios and you've got a thousand of them in your warehouse and nobody wants to buy them, you now have to lower the cost of that good. So what do they do in response to this? They wind up electing Warren G. Harding, right? With Warren G. Harding, um, historians are not often too kind to him, but this is the guy that winds up gambling the way the White House China, if that tells you anything about how his presidency is going to go. He's going to experience a little bit of highs himself in his presidency, and then it's going to get to some lows, as we'll get into. That's from the speech. So when he, Harding takes office, the U.S. economy begins to slump. He gets back in. He gets in there, and they're hoping to see much more of a rise in that economic cycle. Um, Warren G. Harding as well. Um, when he was running for president, um, historians and even certain uh, programs like documentaries or even programs like Boardwalk Empire they, they make reference to how when he was on the campaign trail, they would say to him quite often, hey, don't let this guy speak. Um, he is characterized as a kind of a, uh, I guess, a mimbo, bimbo, or a buffoon a little bit. But the thing is, is that when, when you're talking about elections and you're talking about popularity and you're looking at how people perceive you in terms of appearance, this guy did look like a businessman. One of the things that historians and some other uh, resources do kind of like point to that this guy did look like a businessman. And, and if, you, if, yeah. you, if you listen to the return to normalcy speech exactly. that I posted on Classroom, I'm sure Mr. Heat posted on his as well, it's like pulling teeth. It's so boring. Yes. He was not a charismatic person. Normalcy is not even a word. That is it. It's not even a word, all right? I, so, not an ELA teacher, I don't know. Yeah, so anyway. When we get to the Warren G. Harding gets elected, he had pro-business policies, which is good because that's what business people are going to want. He's going to surround himself also with business people. Um, Herbert Hoover is going to become his Secretary of Commerce. All right? When we look at Herbert Hoover, his career is on the rise. During World War I, this was the guy that was the head of the Food Administration. Uh, since being head of the Food Administration, he said food will win the war. He also helps to feed Europe after the war. If you recall, World War I was fought in Europe. We had the luxury of not having battles taking place in the United States. Herbert Hoover was still over in Europe helping war-torn countries to get food and to kind of help rebuild. Um, so his career is on the rise. He's now Secretary of Commerce. He's going to work to help expand American businesses overseas, as you see that connection we just made there. So that economic recession starting to turn around a little bit right away. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Too bad sound like a smart boy. You gotta be kidding me. Oh, we frozen. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. If you want, I'm gonna fill some time right now with Please some do. riddles for you. Please do. Um, if a farmer has 66 sheep and 10 of them die, 
how many are left alive? If you said 56, you are wrong. You lost me a sheep. The, <laughs> the answer is 50 because there were 66 sheep. And if you listen carefully, I'm saying 60 sick sheep. Are we good to go, Mr. Heek? Oh, and we're back. Oh, and then we're back. <laughs> that was painful. <laughs> so, <clears throat> when we get to Warren G. Harding's uh, inaugural speech, uh, this was an assignment that we did post on Google Classroom earlier on. So, it's now May 14th, 1920. So, I think the best bet was just we go over the questions. What do you yeah, because they've read it. Yeah, absolutely. Don't have to reread it to them. So, when we're talking, what event is Harding referring to when he says, poise has been disturbed, nerves have been racked. There should be a historical event that's referring to it. So... Hopefully, you have to consider a couple of things when you're looking at a document. First is the date, all right? We're just getting out of World War I. After 1919, the Treaty of Versailles is signed. So now we're getting into this whole, this is after World War I. So what poise has been deserved? What nerves have been racked? This would be sending uh, the United States actually being in a war mode, sending our sons, fathers, and brothers over into war. Um, women did participate in World War I. Again, Probably even touching on the fact that we needed to play victory gardens. Food's going to, of course, going to win the war. Go and buy Wheatless Liberty Bonds. Mondays. Wheatless Mondays. You know, that whole the nerves have been racked, too. If you remember that term that talked about, like, the soldiers' nerves, that whole, quote-unquote, shell shock. You know, talk about the, the, the currently we call PTSD. But that, that whole rattling of our whole entire psyche as a country. But those posters, the buy Liberty Bonds, the go and serve in a war, even some of these enlistment posters that were kind of, like, questioning guys' manhoods, this was surrounding them, similar to, for example, our social media today. So this was constantly in people's faces. Now that the war is over, you know, boys, uh, now our nerves are kind of leveling off, I guess you could say. Yep. Um, here we have quite a few words. They define them. They did well here. Um, but what do you think normalcy means? Again, we made reference. Probably it's not even like a real word. Probably it evolved into one. But when we're looking at normalcy, uh, going back to... How in World War I, things were a little, a little bit nerve-wracking. Everything was, you know, all, ha all hands on deck to help soldiers over in Europe to kind of help out to win the war effort. When we're talking about um, that return to normalcy, this is going to way going back to the way life was before World War I. I think this is like a perfect document to be doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think every single one of you, as we are, want to return to normal. None of us want to be teaching you through my iPhone. You know, you guys don't want to be staying at home, sleeping until 10 o'clock. All right, that's a bad reference, yeah, you bad probably reference. do. Yeah. But, but this is not ideal. No. You know, we need to see you, you need to see us. You know, we need to be together, but we want to get back to normal. And that's exactly what Harding is saying here. We've got to get back to the way things were before the war broke out. Normalcy for us in February. Yeah. Like, this is definitely normalcy <laughs> at its best. All right. A lot of words here. What does Harding mean when he says that all human ills are not curable by legislation? Now, with legislation, hopefully we're thinking in our heads, legislation, laws, legislative branch. Government getting involved, yeah. So if we're talking about government getting involved, when he's talking here that all human ills are not curable by legislation, what does he think government's approach should be to this kind of thing? Go back to, if you remember seventh grade, you talk about Thomas Jefferson, there's a specific French phrase where you get your hands off, like Dude, just take a head. step back. Head. I know, we're, we're, was, here. We're, here. we're here, we're here, we're here. You know, laissez-faire, you know, let, get, let, 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 let the government get their hands off the economy, let the businesses, let the people. I think the free enterprise system is a word that we've been, a phrase we've been using a lot this year, where the people set the prices, the people decide what they're gonna sell, what they're gonna make, how much they're gonna sell it for, so forth and so on. So when you go to Jefferson's uh, laissez-faire, then of course, if you, if you get into the Industrial Revolution, when we're talking about Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, that yeah. whole laissez-faire approach, there's pros, there's cons to it. Um, when we're looking at laissez-faire approach, when you're looking at uh, the times of Standard Oil, Vanderbilt, um, that hands-off approach allowed people to not follow the rules, misinterpret the rules, there was a lack of rules, so it kind of got a little bit carried away when you're getting into the Industrial Revolution. Now, uh, that hands-off approach, I think we beat that to death at number four. Uh, five, what is Harding saying that the United States should focus on now, and why do you think that? I'm looking at steady down to get squarely on our feet. Yep. That's what I'm seeing right there. 
Steady down and get squarely on our feet. Uh, get away from the madness of war. Tranquility at home. Oh, peace, love and that. peace and tranquility, tranquility at home. Quite a few of these words back here <coughs> were kind of, you know, positive as well um, when we're getting into that. So that's sticking with the theme of his speech. Now, moving forward. You got anything else we want with this document before we no, uh, look I, at his ranking? Yeah. All right. So when we look at ahead, all right, pretty nice speech maybe. You know, again, as Mr. Kogan was saying, you know, really trying to pull teeth. Um, he's pro-business, that's what people want, people are getting hired, the economy is starting to see a little bit more of an increase. Now, what presidential rankings. Harding, 1982 poll, he was fifth from the bottom. 1990 poll, he's fifth from the bottom. 1994 poll, he's fifth from the bottom. 2002 poll, he's third from the bottom. 2010, he's third from the bottom. He's not considered to be one of our nation's greatest presidents. In fact, he's considered to be one of our worst presidents. Now, if we look here, this should be some probably some familiar names that we've already gone over. I mean, Andrew Johnson, you can see, you know, about his impeachment, you know, during, during Reconstruction, wasn't that great at it. So if you're looking where Harding, uh, his name is in his presidential rankings, he's not exactly in the best of company. Um, something that Grant pops out at me as well. Um, there's going to be in a future lesson, you know, kind of something that we see happening in Grant's administration that's also going to happen in Harding's administration that's probably going to really hurt his rank. Anything else you got here? No, that's about it. All Next right. time we guys see you, we're going to talk about why he's considered to be one of our nation's worst presidents throughout history. See you guys soon.